Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar on uh, user pathways and planning our tech stack. Um, and I just want to start the session by introducing this beautiful artwork in the background, uh, which is by Light Wizard. And he's an amazing based uh, sculpture and image maker based in Melbourne. <clears throat> so please support artists. They're doing it pretty tough at the moment. So um, I'm just running off the run sheet, which can be found here. If you go to action skills, webinars, uh, go to the one we're on today, go to tech stack. It's also in the chat up here. Um, chat is here. So that way you can follow along with what I'm um, talking to. So these are the notes that I'm talking from, and that allows you to come back, um, to come back later and then use that as a reference. Um, all right, so the first thing we will do is we'll look at the central node concept. And we went through this uh, yesterday uh, in our last webinar. Um, however, I'm gonna go through it again because this is really the key of um, what we're trying to do with uh, digital marketing and digital campaigning. Um, the whole idea is to get people that have never heard of you, never come across you, to actually, um, to actually connect um, so that you're found. Then you want to get the get communicating with them, and then you want to get them to start doing things, and then you want them to actually start doing very meaningful things. And uh, meaningful is obviously uh, your um, up to you. So. On the left, we've got uh, various marketing um, from offline running a store through to digital marketing, social media, search, all that sort of stuff. Then we want to sign them into our database. And there are many ways to get people in a database. So the standard way is just a simple sign up. Uh, donations are obviously the best way of getting people to sign up. And um, Petitions are quite common by NGOs to get data into their databases, competitions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you may have a data sharing relationship with some other organizations, although be very careful with that because of privacy, you don't want to just send something to someone that they haven't uh, opted in to get. So you may um, arrange for one organization to send an email and ask for sign up for your database but you wouldn't just grab their um, database and then shoot email to it. Um, that's the definition of spam. Then we want to move them into starting to um, come to events. And I'm aware uh, in this isolation period, this is a bit abstract um, and a lot of orgs are trying to adapt, um, but assuming that it's um, pre COVID and hopefully post COVID. So we want to get them to a rally, info night, party, film night, something that actually gets people together and gets them connected. Um, or there may be a, a bit more of an advanced meeting, which be maybe a planning meeting for an event or a workshop or training or producing some arts or something like that. At that point, you still want them in your database. So you want to bring them back into your data. Um, so then you can keep communicating with them, but at a different level. So you'd be communicating to this group of people differently than you would be just the people who've just met you or have just come off the street. And then you want to move them to the next level of actual active people that are doing far more active things in your in your organization. And then eventually you want them to actually be leadership and playing a leadership role. Right. Okay, so this diagram is exactly the same diagram. It's just visualizing it quite differently. So on the outside is all your marketing and then um, your website is your main tool to capture data, sign up, donation, petitions, et cetera, coming into your database. So however, however you look at it, it's important to understand the concept that you want to move people along a pathway or a journey to um, more active participation. Um, but a database or a CRM, Client Relationship Manager, is a key uh, for doing that. Okay, so from there, um, we'll be looking at, um, today we're talking, focusing a lot on the, the one type of marketing, which is social media. Google is probably the, the most effective um, digital marketing that you can do because if someone's searching for something, they're ready to take action generally or they're ready to buy something or to do something. So if you can rank, um, you we can rank, um, if you can rank on certain terms, then you're much, it's much richer traffic. 
The issue with Google though, search is that it's the limited, the people are only searching an X amount of, um, um, X amount of terms. So even if you're getting all that traffic, there's no more traffic. Um, and I'll be going through uh, search marketing um, in another webinar. The other concept uh, to think about with the uh, digital marketing is um, the eight connection concept. And I'm not sure of the exact number and that will that'll fluctuate. But the concept is that people need to come across your messaging or what you're doing eight times before they'll um, actually connect with you. Uh, in the old days, that used to be a lot less. And as things are getting more complex, that's becoming a lot more. So, um, for example, you may see something coming across your social media. Um, you go, hmm, that looks interesting, but yeah, whatever. And you're seeing it again a little bit later and you're going, oh, that's interesting, but yeah, okay, whatever. And then you can't start seeing it here and there. And you're like, what is this thing? Like, all my friends are into it. I really need to check it out. So then you click through and get to it. So part of what you're also doing is not just trying to connect with people once because you're unlikely to um, move them to the next level. You actually want to look at how you can actually multiple, multiple ways of connecting with them. Okay. So I went through the, the central node concept last week. So if you want a bit more information, then um, have a look at last week's webinar. Um, so I'm just going to drive into social media platforms. Okay, so for me, the basic concept of social media is content and conversation. So your social media will not be very effective if you've got boring, dull content or content that people aren't interested in. Um, so you need to produce content, which is a whole um, strategy on itself. Uh, then it's about conversation. So if you're just talking about stuff the whole time, to yourself, then it's not going to go very far. The, the conversation is the key thing of social media. And it's key for a few reasons. The main reason is people, like it's social media. So your audience and your people want to talk to you. Um, they want to interact, like they're on social media to be social. So if you're um, ignoring them, then that's not quite going to work. The other reason is that the social media algorithms uh, will rank your content depending on how much conversation Mike shares um, is on that. So the more conversation on any post that you've got, then the higher it will rank. So you're doing it both for the people and the robots. And then uh, as new generation social media is coming forward using AI, they'll then be looking more for sophisticated um, discussion and be looking at that side of things and rank. So when you're framing your social media content, conversation. So that's interesting because then you might think about, well, what content will actually create good conversation. Another really important, important point about social media is resources are limited. And again, it doesn't matter how big your budget is, you're still limited by resources. There's an endless amount of content that you, you're able to produce or um, content to push out there. So you've really got to always think about um, scarcity of either time, money, usually both. Conversation versus broadcast. So generally older people that start social media tend to just start broadcasting because that's what they got brought up with. You've got the Murdoch uh, mainstream sort of uh, media construct. And the way that works is the experts write some stuff to you. They print it in a paper, you read it and that you discuss it with your friends. So you, you have, no, it, it's a one way broadcast. Social media is not that it's, um, so if you're thinking in a broadcast model, then it's just simply not gonna be uh, effective. Now, automation versus custom publishing. So when I say custom publishing, what I mean is that you're actively produce, writing your posts in that format. So for example, if you're posting the Facebook, you're actually in Facebook writing a Facebook post, or if you're in Instagram, you're you know, posting a photo and doing, doing that post, which is different to automation. And by automation, what we mean is that you can post to one platform and post to five, six, heaps of other platforms. So there's pros and cons of automation. Um, 
Now, one um, benefit is that you can save a lot of time and get to lots of different platforms. So for example, I'm running a Instagram for my art profile. Um, I'm not interested in a Facebook um, side of things. So I'm automating my posts from Instagram to Facebook. And what I've been seeing happening is that that um, Facebook um, page is actually growing, people interacting with it, and it's actually having a bit of a life of its own. Even though I have not posted any content to it, um, it's just been automated from Instagram. So it's just the Facebook version of Instagram, um, but people who prefer Facebook will get it that way. Uh, and it works going from Facebook to Instagram. No, so from Instagram to Facebook, but it would not work for me to automate my Facebook post to Instagram because it's a different platform. Instagram um, formats things differently. So if I pushed it from Facebook to Instagram, it would just look wrong and it just wouldn't resonate. So same thing with Twitter. Like if I automated that to Twitter, the, the way that Twitter works and the way that it's formatted, it would not look right. So in an ideal situation, you would actually be custom writing your posts for your actual medium. Um, but then you're obviously balancing your resources and making decisions. If, you're, if a certain platform is where your primary audience is, then you definitely should be pu uh, publishing directly to that. Um, as far as automation, there's heaps of tools that can allow you to post from one format to many others. Thing to remember about um, social media and specifically Facebook, is you need to pay to use it. They say it's free to use, and that's simply not true. Um, a few years ago, if you built up your Facebook audience, then um, you're able to then send content to your Facebook page, or and then it would go out to your audience. What happens now is that they throttle it. So they'll only send your content to three to 5% of your audience, unless you pay. So if any Facebook strategy that you um, are planning to use Facebook, if you're planning on building a Facebook profile, then remember that it, when it gets to actually reaching your audience, you are going to need to pay for it. Um, but that that's just the way it is at the moment. Um, it still gives you the option though to still build your profile, um, but don't forget that. Another really important point is that you don't own this platform. So at the moment, my action skills Instagram has been shut down because I broke some rules. Now I've reviewed the rules and I haven't actually broken anything. So what's happened is the automated bot has um, flagged something. Now, because of COVID, the Twitter administrators who you normally talk to to say, give my account back, uh, a lot less of them working. So I'm now, while launching my uh, webinar, webinar program, I don't have my Twitter account. Um, that's just the way it is. You may get banned from Facebook. That's just the way it is. So for example, there was a, um, a mother's group that was concerned with breastfeeding. Now I assume that they would be not as, they will be talking obviously about the mechanics and those sort of things, but it would also be, I assume, an emotional support group, mother's group, that sort of thing. So then at some point, Facebook took offense to the fact that there's breasts on the page and banned the whole group with no notice, with um, nothing. So all those women that were connected to that group lost their community um, instantly, no more. So whenever you're building community in social media, never forget the fact that you don't own it, you don't control it, and they may just take it away from you with a whim. If you're running a campaign against one of uh, an an avid uh, company that Facebook that is paying a lot of money on Facebook ads and that company puts a complaint in, well, maybe they'll affect whether you get banned, whether your Facebook gets pulled, those sort of things. So your strategy should always understand the fact that you may get your social media accounts pulled at any point. And you should also think about how you're using your social media so that you don't get your um, accounts uh, confiscated, um, deleted, et cetera, et cetera. The exciting thing about social media though, is there are no experts. Anyone that is a social media expert is, is not, not telling the truth. The reason is because it's um, so complex, it's changing and it's so diverse depending on your audience. Um, yes, you could be a social media expert in your specific audience and your applications. 
Um, but anyone that's giving um, generalized social media advice is it should be taken as generalized. The real important thing about social media is you must be constantly learning. Um, learning about your audience, learning about the tools, learning about how the tools are shifting. The, the platforms and the medium are moving really fast. So um, Facebook um, has gone through a few phases where they've been shown to be very dodgy. So people have jumped off the platforms, people are jumping back on, people using it differently. Um, and so it's just a flow that you need to then keep a track of. It is also an opportunity for savvy people because if you understand the concept that this is ever changing and fast, if you're able to adapt to it fast and able to look for the opportunities, then you'll succeed very well while the other organizations or people are simply just doing um, what they know what works and that's not going to work for very long. And it is also um, interesting because if there's new platforms and obviously everyone's heard about TikTok, it's not a new platform. However, if you were on that platform when it first launched, you'd have a huge following at the moment. So you would then um, get a much uh, a huge benefit of adapting early to that platform. Which brings me on to my next point about early adapters versus cheap paint. Um, you get huge benefits of being an early adapter onto a platform. The platforms, when they first start out, want um, will give you easy traffic, easy likes, friends, and so you'll grow a profile very easily. The problem is there's so many platforms that if you jump onto every new platform, you're going to be like cheap paint in the context that cheap paint has not much color in it and it's very thin. So your communications are going to be very thin and have not much substance and then they're not going to resonate any platform. So if you've got the urge to jump onto a platform as an early adapter, ensure that you're going through the process that I'm going to discuss a bit uh, next so that you're actually thinking about your social media um, strategically and not just jumping in because, you know, the cool kids, um, my friend's cool kids are on TikTok and so I need to be on TikTok because I heard about it in the media. Um, however, this platform may be really right for you, it just may be not. So um, we'll go through some process to think about that. Okay, so choosing your media platforms. So this is an interesting one. So there's a few questions and process that you go through when choosing your um, platforms that you're going to invest your very limited time and resources. Social media, um, the cost to access are free, but producing content takes a lot of time. Um, managing social media takes time. Conversation takes time. You start then buying tools, um, schedulers and other management tools, and that costs money, and then you want to report it. So you really want to um, really be tight with that side of things. Okay, what platforms do your audience use? This is key. You could be awesome on Facebook and get a huge following, but if your target audience isn't on face, uh, Facebook, like who cares? Um, you know, you could be number one TikTok, and if your audience isn't there, then I don't like who cares? So it's really important to understand what platforms they are on, uh, what social media platforms they're using. Um, and as much as what platforms they're on, it's very important to understand how they use their platforms. So when you're um, looking at a platform, you'll understand how it works the way that you think. You go, okay, this is how it works. Now, a lot of different subcultures or individuals will look at it quite differently to you and use it quite differently. So it's important to um, actually look at what your target's doing. So for example, there's uh, the Instagram party example. So you can link to that article um, from the run sheet. So there's a group of uh, young people use Instagram as a party invite. So they're running a house party or something like that. So what they do is they create up an Instagram profile, then um, they start promoting that profile, people start liking it. So if you get liked back, so if that party um, account likes you, then you're invited to the party. You get all the um, secret messages and all that sort of stuff. What that does is it allows those people to get around Facebook where all their parents and stuff are, or the authorities, and it allows them to run their, um, the hype of the party and all the cool kids um, 
much better lead up to um, the party. And then some of the uh, kids are even more savvy than that. And once the party's gone, they have now got a influential social media account that's now got value. And then the savvier ones, again, don't even have a party. They just pretend to have a party. They'll build up profiles and then um, those Instagram profiles are valuable. So that way of using Instagram is quite different to say I'm using it as an artist where I'm um, not wanting volume. I'm more using it to connect with other artists um, and build, build my artistic profile, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and then if we have a look at some of the, um, say, fitness um, accounts, um, which are more stereotypical of Instagram, they're using it in a quite different way again. So different audiences are gonna use the same platform completely different. Even different, um, you know, um, community nodes within the same genre are still gonna be using it differently. So you need to look at how they're, gonna, how they're actually using it. Another important point is to um, ask how influencers are using it. So I'm just going to jump back to share screen. Um, so I went to post my um, webinar video last night. And when I came up, when I was posting to YouTube, they had things on the side and up comes Gary V. Now, some people may have heard of Gary V. He's a bit of a social media guru. Um, he produces lots of content and says most of the same thing as like give away good quality content and give it free and chat with people. So I was like, well, Gary V's an influence. How is he using um, YouTube? Because it's been a while since I've done research on YouTube on um, how it's been used. So I just went to a, a influence and saw how he's using it. All right. So he had a pretty like his format was pretty um, thin. It was mainly question answer. Um, he is into producing bulk content. So let's just have a look at his um, video description. This is exactly what I was doing last night when I was posting my videos. Um, he, he talks about trying to get people to watch it, then text me here. Now, this is very interesting. Your comments on my oxygen, please say hi. Um, so he, this is his call, this is his secondary call to action. He wants you to comment on the Thing because that will get his video much higher. Um, the text me, I assume, would be lead generation. Um, I didn't go through the um, process of um, texting him to see actually what he's doing there. Um, I assume he would get, he, this is um, getting you on the database. Um, you might say, oh, hi, Gary, I love you, or hi, Gary, can you help me? Whatever you say to Gary, Gary's now got your phone number. Um, so number one, call to action, get them on the database. Number two, if you're not gonna do that, then like comment on my video, I'll make my video better. And then he's like, well, well I'm there, I might just sell you some stuff that I'll make some money out of. Um, and now then he starts selling himself. Um, so that's how an influencer, so whether I take those lessons on or not, and obviously the, um, the selling wine and shoes isn't appropriate to my webinar series, so that's a bit cheesy, but um, I can learn from what, what the expert in the world's doing. So have a look at your, um, what the influencers and what the experts are doing in that context. Um, and I also um, give a plug to James Tuckerman while I'm here. He's a, a Melbourne based um, social media um, consultant. He gives away a lot of free webinars on um, Facebook marketing and social media and that sort of stuff. So you can follow his to his link on the um, run sheet. Now what his um, gig is, he gives away really good free quality content, um, which is why I'm recommending him. And then he presents it like, yes, you can do it. But if you then pay to join my course, then I'll hold your hand and, and I'll help you build it. And that's where he's making his money in that context. Um, and I'd also want to make a point um, with a, mostly a not-for-profit crowd is that when I'm doing most of my learning and researching, um, so usually we'll go through intense phases where I'm upskilling on this sort of stuff, is I always go to mainstream marketing 
sources. I won't go to um, not-for-profit marketing um, sort of stuff. And the reason is, is because the not-for-profit market's always behind. Um, yes, I do go to the conferences and follow the stuff and you do get inf useful information of it, concepts being applied in, in a not-for-profit space, which is different to commercial. But if you go to the commercial um, sources, they're applying what works to just average people. And uh, I believe if we're going to grow our campaigns, we want to talk to normal people and um, they, um, they are the cutting edge. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the commercial marketing um, industry just has no morals and values. So they will just be doing what works. They'll be doing the psychological manipulation and um, the stuff that we ethically wouldn't be doing. So then you can actually see what that's doing and what's working and, and how that, uh, what, how that works. So then you can then go, okay, so how do we apply those ideas with an ethical base or with some respect for people? Um, so an example is the Digital Marketing Australia conference that's in Melbourne. Um, I'm interested in that because it's aimed at small business, um, small, small players, um, aggressive digital marketing, layered with a lot of cheese and not much ethics. So if you can stomach that, there's actually some really good learnings in there. Um, and if you want to see more of the polished end of town and semi-permanent conference, um, used to be a really slick design conference that started to move into um, sort of marketing sort of world. Okay, so I might jump another example. Um, okay, so the example I want to talk about is um, a process of um, choosing a social platform from looking at what influencers are doing. So I'm just gonna share my screen again and show an example. Um, okay, so this is uh, Marigold Health Foods. They do sort of organic, um, high end, ni um, nice um, soup stocks and things like that. Um, and the lovely couple that run this. Um, so when we were looking at this, we realized that recipes are, it makes sense for um, content marketing because generally, you know, you, you can um, show the product being used and people go, I really want to make that really yummy roast tofu. So then I'd buy the product and da da da. So the um, content marketing concept um, totally fits, makes sense with recipes. So they're more like, who would have, who are influencers in the food space? Celebrity chefs. Um, that's quite obvious. Food bloggers, um, secondary and that sort of stuff. But really, if we can get the influential chefs recommending our products, then that's great. So then we went to um, some, we, we looked, I asked her, well, what are the names of these chefs? And we looked them up. And one thing that came very clear is they were using Pinterest. I went, well, that's interesting because, um, so we went and had a look and they were using Pinterest to share recipes. Okay, so that's um, a subculture of um, chefs that are using a Pacific platform in a certain way. And so therefore we'll go, okay, so we need a Pinterest account. We need to start talking to them and, and start um, working with the um, the chefs in a Pinterest context. So in that context, we'd recommend that this um, company's um, primary, um, if not secondary, um, social media account would be Pinterest because that's where their, um, their influences are um, and that's where their communities are. Um, the other thing you want to also look at is like what works for your content. If you've got video content, you'll be looking at like what platforms support video the best. Um, if you've got recipes is the example we're using here, then um, Pinterest is a good example. I'd also do some research on, on how recipes are shared, um, different apps, different communities, that sort of thing. Um, another important point is if you've got keen volunteers. So if you get someone in your organization go, Oh, I love TikTok and I'm, and I'm using it all the time and I want to set up a TikTok account and I want to run it for you. Like, sure. Run the TikTok account. If they fail and it doesn't work, then that's great. Like it actually doesn't matter. Um, however, if that person, you know, gets some traction in, in that platform, that's great. So, um, 
yeah, I'd always look for those sort of opportunities. Or, or if you've just got someone that's really into a um, platform, you might discuss with them, is this platform appropriate to what we're doing? And what do you think about this? And that sort of thing. You may have access to influencers just through other reasons. Um, so you, like, because a lot of not-for-profit um, uh, campaigns um, may have certain celebrities that are um, supporting them. So you, you may look at, well, what platforms are they using? How are they using it? All right, so then how can we position our, um, our social to then leverage them, that sort of thing. Okay, so the uh, other thing um, you wanna do in choosing social media platforms is actually look at some stats. So there's this site here, um, which publishes stats. Um, and again, you can link to it from our um, run sheet. And they will go through some stats of the users. Um, so Facebook, no surprise. YouTube, no surprise. Instagram. Now WhatsApp's interesting because I wouldn't see that as a social media um, or WordPress. Um, he said, but the, the interesting thing about this is it's, this is only really key. It's only got a few points, um, summary points. So there's not a lot of data here. There's nothing about how they're using it, this or that. Um, however, it is still interesting to start getting your stats on seeing it. So your age brackets and that sort of stuff. Um, and then we've got a census one. This is 2018, so a bit out of date, um, but there's a full um, report about how people are using social media. When they're using social media, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start getting some ideas about how people are using it um, in, your, in your demographics. There are paid services. So if you're really keen on data, um, you can pay for it um, and get some really specific stats. The other uh, important thing to think about with your statistics is you actually have statistics yourself. If you don't have Google Analytics set up on your website, then set it up. And on your Facebook, if you have a Facebook page, there's a lot of statistics on that. So you'll be able to go through and have a look at what your, um, what your um, different demographics are doing. What, what does Google Analytics give you? Um, Google Analytics is a whole webinar on its own. Um, yeah, so the, the important thing I think with Google Analytics, if you're a learner, is to just go in there and start looking around at the data, start um, looking at the different settings, looking at um, what sort of stuff that you've got in there. The Facebook page ones are far more um, data rich. Um, they'll, they'll tell you very specific demographics. Um, um, you know, uh, what their likes are, that sort of stuff. If you also get into um, Facebook marketing, you'll see it's a little bit creepy in how specifically you can target people. So the, the data's around there. The other thing is, it would be also just to ask your audience, like, is there a way you could maybe run a poll or um, maybe you could contact some sample um, people from your organization and just ask them how they're using it, what they're using, that sort of thing. Um, and if and for the people who are here yesterday who we worked on character personas, I'd be looking at what are those character personas, then trying to find somebody that matches that, and then uh, some people that match that, and then speak to them like what what software are you using, how are you using it, that sort of stuff. Now, when you're unsure, generally if it's an older audience, they'll be on Facebook as a primary tool. Um, so we unfortunately default to Facebook is problematic um, and it's as expensive as that is. Hang on, let me just turn off my share. Um, but Facebook is the king of social media. So therefore, you know, we do have to um, play with it. Twitter is um, less uptake in Australia, but it generally more academic people, more journalists, um, people who like things a bit more real time. So Twitter's quite a useful um, tool if you're a not-for-profit campaign group because um, people of influence, uh, politicians pay attention to Twitter, um, journalists, those sort of things. So to be able to build up um, relationships um, with journalists is, is really a key, key um, outcome. 
Instagram's more for visual based. Um, so if you've got beautiful content, um, as far as aesthetically content, um, Instagram will get that whole, uh, more of that whole audience. YouTube obviously is a video based platform. So they're sort of the main, main ones and that, you should, that should be obvious to all of us. Um, but the stats aren't telling us any different at the moment. Um, but with the um, smaller, smaller social media, that's where you're getting more targeted subcultures. So if you're trying to target a very um, specific type of people, then um, there's where the opportunities are. Okay, so I've just been going for um, 40 minutes. So I might jump the break um, to after just the next section and then we'll um, have a break. Um, if you've got any questions, um, let me know. Um, I'm usually doing these, um, this training in a classroom environment. I tend to get a lot of questions and then um, go on tangents and things like that. So um, I'm actually running a lot faster than I'm quite used to, but then I'd rather have a quick one than uh, just waffle on. All right, so an assets plan. Um, so the jargon for an assets plan is called a tech stack. So a tech stack is a collection of software that pieces together to, to make your platform. So you may have WordPress synced in with Nation Builder, um, sits on Facebook, uh, the, um, talks to Facebook, um, then you may have um, a different donation form. So it's the collection of all the software that you're using to produce your bigger picture platform. Um, it's pretty rare these days to have an all-in-one platform and what's happening a lot more is that we're connecting lots of different platforms like this picture to make a bigger a bigger um, hole. All right, so this is when we produce frontline action on coal. I've taken some things out of it, um, purely for security. Um, Flack has a few people that don't like the organization. Um, and I'm also, this is way out of date. So um, if this was current, I wouldn't be showing it again. Uh, this was the, this is the actual second um, tech stack document that I did. The, the first one um, was pretty much um, after I'd been there in, with this campaign for a while and we did an audit of all their um, assets. And then, um, and so these, these, by vi visualizing these plans, then you can, people can really see the complexity of what we're doing here. So you might be able to see there's quite a lot of complexity to um, what Frontline Action on Coal was running. Um, and this is really important if you're working in volunteer teams. So then um, volunteers can, can jump in, um, see what's happening. They go, oh, I really want to work in this area. Or I want to work in that area. Um, it also means that if you've got people with skills, just say you get uh, a social media expert come in or um, someone that's actually got, got some skills that are relevant, then, then they can look at this and actually really quickly get on board about what you're doing and then actually be able to help you with stuff. It also allows you if you're running consensus-based decisions so that people actually understand the ramifications of dis discussions that they might be making here or there. So the plan before this that we did, we once we audited all the um, sites, we realized that we had a renegade site. So somebody set up, uh, so this is for the front um, Laird blockade, which is um, at the Laird State Forest in New South Wales, which is a coal mine what well, was a beautiful forest that they've now destroyed to become a coal mine. And um, some, some activists had set up a website for the campaign and it was ranking on all the Google search terms. And um, the website was inaccurate in a lot of ways, but it wasn't being updated and it was just sitting there and it was outranking the proper, like the official website. And so that was hugely problematic for us because it was taking all the traffic and then bouncing it because there's there nowhere for, for us to then sign them up to a database, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we then, a uh, long process to get that website back. Um, so yeah, you really got to keep an eye out for well-meaning people that maybe aren't as sophisticated in some of this thinking that we're going through today, that have just set up sites that are actually undermining what we're trying to do. And in the, that case, that site was heavily undermining us and um, doing us quite a lot of harm damage. 
um, and you know people setting up D DIY websites. So if the, if the, if someone sets up a do-it-yourself website for your campaign, but it's not competing, and it's clear that you know they're doing their thing and we're doing our thing, and they're um, we care about the same thing, then that's great. Um, it's only when they look like the official one or um, that sort of stuff. Um, the other thing looking at this map is you'll see um, the colors I've got. So this is, as well as doing our digital assets, we're also moving over to encryption um, and more security. Um, and so the pink ones are the ones which are public and the authorities have direct access to. And then we're um, looking at setting up new encrypted systems. Um, so yeah, that's the, the flag tech stack. All right, I'm gonna share screen. I'm gonna talk about website uh, briefing um, and planning, which is a subject close to my heart. Um, but I'm just gonna jump back to the central node and just to visualize why I believe that a website is the most uh, critical component of your tech platform, tech stack. Now, obviously, there's a lot of exceptions to this, um, obviously, depending on your strategy. But just if we're defaulting to sort of a standard strategy, your website is key because you get to control your website. If uh, Facebook start charging for your audience, you control your audience. If um, your, your Twitter gets blocked, if your Instagram gets deleted, whatever, you've still got your control. So your website is something that we... And the reason this is a circular is that we want to use all these things to bounce back to our website. So a lot of people are like, I want to build my Facebook, or I want to build this, or I want to build that. Um, it's hard to get this and that when we, um, oh, sorry, I just looked at the question, lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, so it's a, it's a bit hard to, um, if you're just building your, your Facebook um, account, it's actually hard to, to control how you have those relationships with people. So my aim would be not to build the Facebook um, page, but more build the Facebook page to drive traffic back to your, um, back to your website. Uh, as well as getting them into your database, then you can also then start educating them um, and various other things that you can do via your website. So um, now we want to actually plan what our websites, what we want to do with our website. Um, so off the run sheet. Never start a website without a brief. And never brief without clear goals. Now we went through goals um, yesterday um, and it's interesting to for something that seems so simple about what is I'm trying to do with my website is actually really hard for lots of people. Um, and we had quite a struggle with the group yesterday getting clear goals. Um, and I will upload that transcript from the Zoom to um, YouTube, to the YouTube video that I've already uploaded. Um, so you can get an idea of goals. So you really need to be really clear with what you're trying to achieve with your website. And then you wanna start briefing. Now it's really uh, important for many reasons to have a brief. Number uh, one really important point is lost in communication. So what I think, uh, what I understand about what we're trying to do with the website may be completely different what you're thinking. If you're working with a group of people, you're all maybe using the same words, but you're thinking something quite differently. Or you might be thinking something very similar, but using different words. Um, so it's really clear to, uh, is the screen not shared? Oh, yep, that's right. Um, thank you for checking in, though. Um, so it's really important to have a brief. Um, and that way, if there's any, um, any disagreements or miscommunications or um, disagreements is the way we want to approach it, then that um, process can be done in the briefing stages. So then when you start talking about building or if you're talking about working with people who you're going to build or trying to get a quote, it's very clear what you want. Um, it's, it's very uncommon that I ever see um, doing uh, commercial websites that ever see a decent brief come across my um, table. Um, so for example, I got a three page technical brief come through last year. I looked for the goals. There's no goals in document. And they said, what did you think? I went, I didn't read it, it sucked. 
be more politely than that. Um, but basically, three pages of tech just were relevant to me um, because they they jumped to why we're doing it and just started doing it. And so they could have been working like complex tech that actually doesn't achieve anything. Um, so by yeah, have it, starting with the goals, then getting the tech comes later. Um, and the tech's becoming a little less relevant these days. It, by having a, um, a brief allows you to reduce your complexities. I'm um, a fan of what I call technological minimization. So that is looking at like, how do we make things as simple as we can? And if you've got a, a, a well um, communicated brief, then we can start looking in that and say, well, how do we simplify this? How can we do this as, as easily, as cheap as possible? Um, or in the future, we talked about phases last um, webinar, in different phases, will this allow us to then go to the next phase easily? If, um, if we're unclear on the brief and then we build something and then um, we're really unclear here, so we build something complex and then we wanna go, oh no, that's not quite working, we wanna do that, then it sometimes can actually be really complex to, to jump to this, to that. And then you might go, well, it's just easier to, to delete the whole lot and start again and then you've just blown your budget. Um, so it's really important to be clear uh, on that. Um, also with your brief, Think about when you visit a doctor. So if you go to a doctor and say, look, I'm sick. The doctor's like, yes, yeah. Okay, so that's not helpful. So you wanna like, okay, so um, my stomach's sore. Okay, that's not helpful either. Okay, so if I eat this certain type of food or like at this time of night or, you know, and starting giving them more details and then the doctor can start piecing, okay, I get what you want. Da, da, da. So it's important to, um, Start putting in specific details of, of things that you want in your brief. But also remember it is a brief as well. Um, it, the idea of having a brief is to get everybody to agree on what we're trying to do, uh, how we're gonna apply the goals to a technical context. So you don't need a three page technical brief. Generally what I wanna do um, when I'm starting a website is we actually just get a general brief sorted so that we get an idea of what we're trying to do. Then from there, we do a technical brief where we adapt that to, in my case, I use WordPress um, and various other tools. So how do I translate that brief into an actual technical build? Um, and then you've also got the style brief. So how are we gonna make it look? What are the aesthetics? That sort of thing. So they're actually two different types of briefs, but both of them will not work without a, um, a bigger picture um, brief of what you're trying to do. So an example of the style um, brief was that um, uh, quite a large organization came to me and said, oh, uh, we, we keep getting all these web designers and they're, they're making bad design. We just can't get them to build a website. And I was like, okay, so um, wh where, what's your brand personality? Um, where's your, your style guide, your, des, your design briefing? And they looked at me like I was talking another language, which I was for them. So we went through a process where we um, defined the um, brand personality, which there's another um, webinar on this, which they went kicking and screaming. Um, and I had to use different language and, and get through that. Um, then we um, did a design brief. And through this process, it ended up that then um, I had another friend that was a graphic designer and the volunteered, so I didn't even design the thing. Um, but we gave them a tight brief uh, and then they built this beautiful design. Everyone's like, this is awesome. This is the best website ever. Um, and the, the reason I'm telling this story is because it wasn't the designers that were doing good or bad. It wasn't that, that um, this design was better than that. It's just that, this, the last design actually had a clear brief and then could interpret it and then do their job. Um, the first, like they went through a heap of designers. So the first processes, they had no system and therefore they didn't get the results that they were looking for. Um, and if you don't have those sort of skills um, to go through the briefs, like at least start, at least try. And the, the key thing about the webinars that I'm doing is I'm sort of introducing concepts. So at least you can start thinking about them. So when you're working with um, 
professionals or trying to do it yourself, at least you're thinking the way that a professional would, would work. So this is the briefing document that I was using and I still sort of use it when, um, when I've got people stuck. I, after I've done this webinar series, I'm actually going to be rebuilding this um, quite differently using some, some of the new concepts that, I'm, um, that I've learned since I've done this. It's quite an old document. So, um, but basically, um, and this is free to download. Um, there's a link on the run sheet, but if you go to either Action Skills, free resources or device, you get to this. Um, so we're looking at talking about budget, who's involved. This is important, who makes decisions, because I have worked with um, organisations where I've worked with people, we've got to the end, and then the CEO goes, no, nah, that's completely wrong. And we're like, well, we've built it now, or we've, we've you've, and they're like, so that the, who pays for that? Um, is it them? Is it us? So in that context, I really want to know who actually makes the decisions so that when there's key decision making in the process, then they actually will make those decisions. So for example, they would sign off at the goals, they would sign off at the brief, they'd sign off at the prototyping stage. So then when we started to get a finished website, they've agreed to, to and we can only ever, we only need to go one step back. Um, you know, do they have other people that we work with? Um, okay. Why do you need a new website? So this is just checking in to see if they've got their goals sorted. Um, and if they do, that's great. I mean, I always question them because I think goals are such an essential part of what we do. Um, however, if they have no idea, then I know that I need to um, get that straight before we do any work. Um, and then um, what are you trying to do, do with the website um, as far as specific application, traffic, response, leads, we talked about target audience uh, last website, last webinar. Um, okay, so why is why are you better than your um, competitors? So now we're trying to trying to look at um, some of the, the benefits and the unique um, applications of, of their campaign or, or what they're doing. So a SWOT, um, you may know that in um, business um, analysis framework. So this is just looking at um, looking at how we can compete with in, in the market or compete for attention um, in more of an activist context. Okay, website management. Now, what I come across quite often is that we talk about, okay, so we're gonna do some social media and you've got to add some posts and you're gonna maintain your website and do some search and content marketing, but then they don't allocate anyone to actually do it. So you'll get, say, maybe someone in the organization who is already working long hours, just to they say, well, they'll do that. Um, so in that context, that's just not gonna work because the person just can't magically do more work. So we really want them to have an idea of the ongoing cost. And in the old days, um, 10 years ago, most of the cost of a website was upfront because they used to be expensive to build. Now websites are really cheap to build and, um, and I recommend you spend less upfront and more running it. So we're looking at more like, what what of our cost, time or money are we going to invest in running the website ongoing? Because that's really key um, to the success or not. Um, more resources and time, money, the better you can run, run the ongoing website. And in this context, the big change here wouldn't be the website, it would be the tech stack, the tech platform. So I'd have to work out what language to use for uh, a beginner to understand that. But it's not about running your website, it's about running your content marketing, um, uh, slash search um, campaign slash website slash um, social media da, da, da. Um, so we're looking at who will be updating and promoting your website and what skills they have um, so we we do training and support as part of what we do so we're really looking at do they actually have the skills to do what they're doing um, or you know where would some, where would we outsource some specific skills because it's not worth them learning it that sort of stuff. So we can start to do some real planning about how they're um, going to actually implement something successful. Uh, weekly budgets, um, actually we've just, oh yeah, weekly bu budgets. Then we're looking if they've got an idea of what their, their content um, design is gonna look like. Um, okay, so what features? So here we're sort of hinting at a technical um, brief, like what 
functionality do you actually want this website to do? Um, and again, this is quite out of date, um, but you know, people will usually tick Google and they'll tick um, you know, members only section, whatever. Um, now search um, has been for a long time key. So we, we really want them to see where they are in their understanding of search, um, search marketing. So if, if they're savvy, then they'll put a good answer. And if they're not, they won't. So we'll be able to just look at their answers and really tell what they're, um, where they're at. Um, social media, um, again, this is also got a bit less about it. So we're just having a look at um, what accounts they've already got. Um, okay, so now we're moving in just to a little bit of um, style design. Um, so these words just help us get ahead around um, the feel, the look and feel of the website. Um, and now if they've got a style guide or corporate requirement, we, we definitely need to know that. So if you're working for a not-for-profit, a lot of them now have style guides. So they'll have certain fonts and colors, um, graphics, that sort of stuff. So if you've got any of that, then if you're building a website, you need to build it to those specifications or else the people um, in the org just, well, you need to have that maintained brand. If you don't have style guides and that sort of thing, then website projects actually a really good um, project to actually get some of these things in place. Um, because when you're, um, when you're connecting very minimally soft touches with people across different platforms, to have consistent fonts, colors, and branding is actually key for them to recognize you each time they come across you. And then start building that um, reinforcement that, hey, I should look at these people a little bit more. Accessibility is something that's really ignored a lot, and I urge you uh, not to ignore it. And what accessibility is, is people with disabilities. However, I, I would, um, and unfortunately some people think, well, it's just a small part of the market, so why should we care? Well, there's two really, really key reasons to prioritize accessibility. One is that if you're doing a, a government website, I think way back 2000, um, I know it wouldn't be 2000, maybe 2010, they brought a law in saying every single government website has to um, comply with WCAG, which is a accessibility standard. Um, so if you're doing anything that's uh, important information, um, it should be accessible. The other thing um, about accessibility is if you make it accessible for um, people with disability, you actually make it better for everybody. So an example would be if we've, if we've got a, um, a pub and it's got some stairs and we go, oh, well, we're gonna put a ramp in for people, um, for people to make it more accessible. But then you just get people that like walk up the ramp because it's easier or someone with a pram that may walk up or someone that's, not feeling very well that day to walk up. So by building that ramp, you've actually made it better for everyone. And so if you're following accessibility rules um, in your website, then you're actually making things a lot easier. Um, things like contrast, um, how you structure your content, that sort of stuff. And I'll talk about that a bit more in some of the other webinars. And since this um, was um, published, there's now a third key reason for accessibility and that is voice so how many people have you seen gone hey google or they're driving their car and they go hey car play me like can you um find me some information about something so the the technology for being able to translate a, a website to, te to voice came from a thing called screen readers that were designed for people who are visually impaired or blind. So if you make your optimize your website that a blind person can read it, then that means that somebody who's driving their car that says, hey Google, will actually be able to have your website read out to them really effectively. So um, there's heaps of benefit things to, um, reasons to care about that. Okay, content. One of the biggest gripes of every web developer I probably know is the complaints about getting content from the web, from the um, client. It's one of these um, unicorns, um, mystical beasts, like the client has the content apparently, or they're working on it and it never happens and never doing it. Uh, so a big part of what we try to do is actually get the content or help them produce it. 
um, or better still produce it for them. Um, so we're trying to work out what content they've got, what we need to produce. Um, and we'll talk about what's good about the website, what's bad, look at the traffic. Um, okay, so something really important when you're um, trying to improve your website is actually to look at what other people in your space are doing. Um, whenever I start a website project, I'll always have a look at what's out there, um, look at all the people, um, and then I start taking notes. This is really good. This bit's really good. I like that. Oh, that, that works well. Um, this bit, that sucks. I don't like that bit. Okay, so this is uh, an, uh, um, an example of a, a briefing process. Um, now, if you can get everyone to agree on that, then, then you can really go forward to the next, next stage and actually start um, prototyping and getting your website sorted. Now, prototyping, any questions so far? All right, I'll just stop sharing on that. Okay, so prototyping is where we make um, sort of a model of the website. Um, now, in the old days, <laughs> five years ago, or even three years ago, um, the websites were custom coded, usually from scratch, or would get most of what your website was, and then would have to code it. And it was, it was time consuming and expensive. So before we did that, and also changes would cost money and da da da. So before we did that, we'd actually make a mock up so that we could put all the things in the place, um, work out our, um, make sure that our user experience is really good, um, make sure that the, 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 it can flow, that can sign up, the important things are there, all that sort of stuff. Um, before we then build the website. And if you're building, say, an app or um, getting a website custom coded, then you definitely need to prototype your website because it, if it's gonna take two minutes to move a box to there and change the text to there versus it's gonna take 20 coding hours to move the box to there and put the text to there, it's far better to spend 10, 10 minutes of the time than it is 10 uh, development hours. Um, now, I'm generally prototyping. I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to talk for a bit and then I'll show you some examples of prototyping. Um, and all my prototypes are um, old examples. And the reason is, um, one of the reasons is that I'm, I'm sort of doing slightly different work in the last few years. However, I'm now doing a lot of my prototyping live. So the tools to build websites are getting so much easier, cheaper and easier that I'm actually building websites um, straight using, um, I'm prototyping using the um, actual tools I'm building the websites out of. So for example, I'll show you, um, share the screen. So this website here, my website is not a built website. This is a prototype. Um, I haven't got any pictures on it. It looks a bit boring, right? Um, that's because it's not, it. this is not, this is in draft mode. Um, I'm still working out what I'm doing with it. So, but I'm, by um, being able to prototype in the actual tools that we build websites means that I've now got my prototype signed off and it's done and now it's a live website. I don't have to do any work, or extra, any extra work. Um, the other, uh, another good benefit of it as well is that we can also look at what it will look like uh, responsively, so on different platforms and mobiles. So it takes a little bit more time to do this than it would say an illustrator, um, but then it is getting a bit faster, um, comparable, and yeah, we've got the website done. So for a client, we're going to save heaps of um, heaps of money for them because once we get the prototype um, signed off, we've got most of the website built. Um, so this is using um, Divi sitting on top of WordPress, but there's um, other website technologies, um, Squarespace, Wix, that sort of stuff. Um, the other reason I'm doing less formal prototypes is that I'm um, I'm doing what I call solo leads. So in that context, I'll take a brief from a client, I'll build the website how I think it should be, and then I'll give it back to the client for crit. 
Now, that I would never do in the past because it would be too expensive to make changes, whereas now it's getting a lot cheaper and we can flow a bit more. It's a lot quicker and easier for me just to use my experience. I understand what they're doing. I understand what I'm doing. So I just make it happen and then get some feedback. Um, and that works really well when I'm working for groups that have, they just can't decide on anything or are unsure about things. Or um, I just go in there, get it done, and then um, get some quick from that. Okay, so let me show you some examples of what a prototype. So the thing with a prototype is they're just pictures. And it's important. Um, so let me jump back. This is website that's, okay. So you'll see here is it's not meant to look fancy. We're purely talking about where we're putting stuff. Now, when we first started building websites, we would actually print these out and would trace them by hand before giving to the client. Because the client used to think, oh, is that what our website's gonna look like? And we're like, no, it's a scribble. So we'd literally scribble them so that I'd get it as a scribble. The point we're trying to make is putting a picture here, we're putting the text there. This is as fancy as it needs to be. We're looking at how much screen space it's done. So you could just do this in pen and paper and for a lot of, or whiteboards. So for a lot of people, that's where you actually start as you just start drawing it out. Uh, one of the main things you want to do with a um, prototype is you want to start getting that navigation worked out. Um, okay, so you can sort of see here we're doing various designs, that sort of stuff. So then we can design, we can decide how we can minimize how much um, real estate, how big things are, that sort of stuff. So that's that example. Um, okay, so this one has also been, the website's been built and the website's been replaced. Um, so they, again, it's quite old, um, but I'll just give you an idea of what we're doing with prototyping. So in these days, you can also get interactive prototyping tools. Um, but I'm sort of like, well, if you're getting, uh, paying for an interactive prototype tool, why aren't we just building it in the website? Um, so this one has color in it, but that's because I'm using color as a navigational item. So color is actually key to the interface. Um, so in this case, they wanted to bring, they had like 20 books um, that was costing them a lot of money to print online. And then, um, so we wanted to, for people to, be able to differentiate between the different books. Um, so that website, um, this is one, Seniors Rights. So um, you can sort of see how simple they can get. Okay, so this is an older website as well. So this is for a, 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 conf, a concert called Stereosonic. Um, we, we, I pitched the client we should do mobile first design. And so what that means is we design for a mobile phone first. Um, and uh, we just looked at their stats and most of their traffic's coming from mobile phones. So the client was pretty like, yeah, sure, of course. Um, so you can see here, we're starting to, uh, hang on, let me get some of this up. Drive. Computer. Here we go. Uh, let me see if I can get these bigger. Here we go. Okay, so this is we we're starting blocking out the you know this is the top bit, all the different things that we need. So in that context, we could be and this website was every line of code was audited for performance because. I think they did 80,000 transactions a day just before the event. So it needed to be fast and efficient. So there was no way we'd be prototyping this you know, website construct. It would be definitely needed to be, um, definitely needs to be um, prototyped like this. So if we're doing this project, uh, say starting tomorrow, then we would do the same project. Um, they also had different um, needs from various sponsors and various different things. So we could put that in there and make sure that we got all that but you can see that we've, it's just simple boxes um, doing information design. Uh, and then we can get sign off. So I was happy with them. I showed them to them. They made changes until they were happy. So I'm happy, they're happy. Um, we're also working with their creative director who was doing mainly the aesthetics of that. 
Um, so at that point, then we started building the site. Um, uh, are there any questions about prototyping? Okay. So I'm um, just going to talk some buzzwords um, called agile. Now agile has got some very technical definitions and um, a lot of, um, you know, specialist um, jobs and books written on it. I'm just going to use a very um, generic sort of small um, definition. It's simply go fast and adapt. You're, you if you go through a process, like with the stereosonic site, we needed to go through a long process and, and actually get it right because we had no opportunity to change it live. If we're, if we're getting 80,000 um, visit ticket sales on a day and we get that wrong, then um, they lose the ticket sales. Like we can't not um, get it right. So we had to do whatever, we had to do as much planning as we, as we could. Um, now, in the context, like my action sales is not getting 80,000 a day. Um, so I've got the luxury of just getting it wrong. I can get it wrong all the time. So what I, rather than um, spend the time, and it was an extra expense to go through that process, of course, but it saves a lot of money in the long run. In that context, I just whack up the website. Um, we're not trying to make a final product. We're just trying to get something that works. Then we launch it. So I've got a website that works, launch the webinar program that I'm running now. Then I'm going to go back. I'm going to do see what feedback's coming from the website. How did it work? Then I'm going to add some stuff. And then I need to do images and that sort of stuff. Now, the important thing about test bad, bad and agile thinking is that you um, do an experiment, you get something up quick, then you test it. Then you refine it, then you test it, then you refine it. So there's been many cases in, um, in business or campaigns where you've got some experts that have um, spent a lot of time finishing a campaign or, or, or finishing a website, they're launching it and it doesn't work in the, or in the market, but they've just spent all their budget on it. And so therefore they're stuck with it for a few years and it's just, whereas if they spend a bit of their money, put it out there, see what comes back, I then go, okay, we're going to fix this. We're going to change that. Oh, actually, um, having an image-rich text site wasn't going to work. We can change this, do that. Um, and so if you've got the luxury of not having to do all your sales in one day, I recommend that you don't look at your website as finished. We also talked last webinar about um, different campaign phases. Same concept. You want to be able to make your tools be able to adapt and adjust. Um, are the full recordings and screen share available on YouTube channel? Yes, every night. So, well, last night I posted the video and um, tonight I'll aim to get this video up. Um, how do you read the stats and analytics on current site? Is it built in or does it need to be added? So uh, Google Analytics is a separate tool and you need to sign up for a Google Analytics account and then get the tracking code and put it into your website. Um, so that's important. So whenever you publish your website, I recommend that you put in Google Analytics, even if you, you're, you're not planning on using the data. So there's been many cases where I've had a client come up to me and go, oh, we've, um, we've been speaking to this marketing expert and, and we need Google Analytics data and could you set it up? And I'm like, you've already got data and look, here's two years of data for you. And they're like, wow, that's exciting. So the more data you've got, the better. So Put your um, setup, either Google Analytics or some other analytics. It's really key with websites to track everything. Um, everything with websites is uh, measurable and, and can be tracked. So when we're talking about testing and experimenting, this is what we're, we're saying. So for example, do you spend 500 bucks on Facebook advertising, 500 bucks on search marketing, 500 bucks on the local radio, you should test every cent that you spend and you should be testing every, um, all the time that you're spending. Um, you know, we're, we're running this content marketing campaign and then we're seeing what traffic comes to the website. We're seeing how many people are signing up to the database, those sort of things. Um, so I've, 
don't have that in this webinar, but um, setting up testing um, is really key to being able to improve. Because at the end of the day, we're making educated guesses on how do we prototype and how do we design and all that sort of stuff. And um, going back to the mainstream marketing conferences that I was talking about, pretty much any decent professional marketer now will say, I don't know. A few years ago, they'd go, I'm a professional and I'm experienced and I know how to make ads that work. Now what they say is they go, I'm a professional and I know how to set up a testing system where we can work out what works. Um, so any marketing expert that says they know what works, get rid of them quick because they actually, no one ever did. They were just better at guessing than others. Whereas now we've actually got technology where we can test it. So yes, you can guess. Um, and that's called A-B testing. And we, we did some of that. Um, when we were at the lead, we would run, um, because Twitter, we could shoot, it's normal to just to shoot a lot of things out, whereas Facebook, you, you shoot like one a day. So we, we'd make memes um, and shoot heaps of memes out at Twitter. So we'd make minimum of three memes. And then the one that was most popular on Twitter would then run on Facebook. And um, it was interesting because one time, we, we had two really good memes and then we had, we had no other ideas. And so I made this really lame crappy one. We pumped it out and it just got heaps of tra traffic. And <laughs> both me and my mate were like, what just happened there? Okay, so we put it onto Facebook, off it went. Um, so yeah, always test your stuff and always assume that you may be educated and good at guessing, but you, you don't understand and you don't get it. Um, can you monitor all that testing via Google Analytics? Okay, so what Google Analytics will test is, um, okay, it's a few ways of answering that. One, on a, on a simple level, it will just test your page views. Um, however, you can put in tracking, um, like it's got very advanced um, processes for you to be able to define your goals. Um, yes, and I use that language. Um, so you can program in what your goals are and you can actually track stuff like that. So Google Analytics gets very complex um, if you dive into it. And so you can monitor a lot of that complexity. Uh, I'm only using it on a simple level. I'm looking at like more of the page views and um, who, who's, where's, where's the traffic coming from, that sort of stuff. There's also another technology called heat maps. Um, and what that does is usually a plugin that sits over your site. So it slows it a bit. So I'd usually only run it for a little bit. But what that does is it puts like a heat map over where people click and, and where their mouse is going. Um, so that's another technology you can use. Um, Facebook, uh, there's a thing called Facebook Pixel, which is a little dubious, dubious ethically, but basically if you put a Facebook Pixel on your website, then Facebook is able to track exactly like transactions and stuff. So there's so many websites now that they have Facebook pixels that now Facebook can track you even when you're not logged into Facebook. If you don't even have a Facebook account, um, Google will still create one for you and still track you across the internet. Um, so if you're a basic setup, would you be at least looking at your Google Analytics data, you'd at least be looking at your, um, your Facebook data and then also your call to action. So if you've got a CRM um, or you've got a, uh, product you're selling. I mean, that's the ultimate metric. You know, you've got someone to do something. Um, but yeah, tracking gets really complex. Um, however, I do urge you at least to be looking at the basics and having an idea of what you're doing. Because the worst thing you want to do is spend heaps of time and effort doing something that's not working. You want to be able to look at it and go, yeah, it's not working. Okay, how do we, we change? We do that. Okay, um, and that's the key to Agile. There's no point being fast and playing around if you're not um, actually seeing what's happening and testing on that. Um, it, with, with action skills at the moment, I've got, not, I've got not enough data to be able to test or to, to do much. And it's more just getting a website up um, before I can get the webinars. Um, so get the webinars launched due to the COVID um, situation. So what I'll be doing is I'll be looking through my data for people that I know and I'll ask them what they think, what was the process like, and I'll, I'll do it like that, um, as well as looking at my analytics and data. So from then I'll go to the next design phase of then um, what, what will I do to my website to make it better. Um, I'm aware that I need to put imagery and stuff like that. 
um, and that will get me to launch phase and then um, I'll take it from there. Okay, ongoing um, roles and tasks. Now this is really key because um, a lot of uh, people just see social media as an add-on. We're just gonna add it on and then it just doesn't get done. Um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is very time consuming and some people may be out of, um, so it's important to define those, those roles because either you're doing it, someone in your organization is doing it or you're outsourcing to someone else. And there's plenty of social media um, or you know, content agencies out there that will um, help you to do stuff. But in that context, you need to work out a bit what you, what these tasks and roles are now. So we've, we've started looking at our um, tech stack, uh, what different technologies we're gonna use. Um, we're understanding that social media is content plus conversation. So all that is time, all of that's different specialist skills. Um, so we need to then start learning. Uh, start defining what what these tasks and stuff is. Now, one very important thing when you're working with volunteers or staff as well is boundaries. Um, social media is an endless rabbit hole of time. Um, it tends to not be a um, a thing that you switch off on the weekends. It just goes and goes. So it's really important to have roles and tasks because then you can go, okay, here's some boundaries. Here's where we stop. So that to make sure that your um, people are just not burning out. The other thing is um, there's been plenty of discussion about the impact of um, social media on mental health. Um, so that's also important to have some boundaries to make sure that, you know, you're not, it's not impacting on people. Um, and also if you're working on some, um, more hardcore um, campaigns, then you're also gonna deal with other mental health implications of um, the content or um, the trolls, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or even the emotional connection of if you're losing a campaign or if you're um, trying to save a forest and then that forest um, is getting bulldozed and you're doing your social media content and managing the conversation, like that's gonna have a mental um, impact on people. So it's also really important to, to put in context. The other important thing about um, tasks is we wanna plan to scale. We don't want to have a small campaign, we want a big campaign. And so at the moment, there's only one of you. So we really want to um, make sure that, um, or there's, yeah, but most of the stats on the poll is one of you. So what happens when you've got three of you? Um, or if you're wanting to do a call out for volunteers, like what are you asking for? Um, you want to scale both your conversation and your content. So if you've got roles, which one is like to produce content, there might be some people that really love writing, but not talking to people, or there might be someone who's arty and, um, but then there's some people that you know that just love talking on Facebook, like Facebook, Facebook, and you're like, people are saying, get a life, get a life, get a life. And you're like, no, come work with us and just talk on Facebook the whole day and you can help save the forest. For example, if you've got a defined role of what their, the Facebook moderator is, like that person's in heaven actually doing something useful and they're on Facebook. And for example, um, yeah, so that helps recruit volunteers or if you're actually trying to get funding for a paid position, you can um, show them the diagram of your tech stack and your asset map that we showed before. You can show the digital strategy and the goals and then you can say, here's the task that we need to fulfill to reach those goals and we need funding for this position and this is the task they're doing. And then the person or the funding body goes, that totally makes sense, here's your money. Whereas if you go, oh, we're gonna use Facebook because we're gonna use it to win the campaign, like they'll be like, sure, here, yeah, $5. Um, so that's really key for you to, to try and get funding. Um, and it's also key just not to blow money. Um, if someone goes, oh, we wanna spend 10 grand on this beautiful video. And um, if you've got a decent strategy, you might go, well, we could actually, we're better off producing 20 videos for like 500 bucks each um, and see how they go rather than one expensive, for example. Um, it allows you to identify gaps. So I, one of the messages I want you to take home is you're never going to do all the things. You will always feel like there's more to do. Um, so, but in saying that, you also got to look at what are the priorities. 
So my priorities at the moment is to get content up so that I've actually got content to talk about. The most next priority will be to, to talk about it. So um, I need to have those have some prioritization um, and then I'll knock off at this time to say I haven't finished everything but I've got to my point I've got my prioritization prioritization all right so I'm just going to show some uh, examples um, share screen this one share uh, okay so this is a very old one um, but I'll, oh, I'll give you an idea this is uh, before Friends of the Earth got their current website, Nation Builder, and also their entire um, office tech system was run by volunteers who, it, it, the, the tech paradigm changed. In the old days, it was like there was low expectations. You had this volunteer crew that were providing those low expectations. Then we had a paradigm shift where there was this huge expectation on technology because techno the, the, the technology curve had shifted and that volunteer crew just no longer could sustain it um, in a sustainable way. So we're all like, okay, so now we need to actually redesign everything that FO does. Um, so we're looking at hardware and that sort of stuff as well. You'll see we've, we're doing an asset planning. So looking at websites um, and assets, but then also how the actual office functions um, and that sort of stuff. Um, okay, and then, you know, what we're outsourcing technical. So now here we are starting to look at um, the tasks and roles. Here's what the, here's the things that they do. Um, description of the, the role and what they do. So here's all the different teams that were going to be phase one of our tech adaption from um, having their email literally in their office um, and using old school phones to actually running a, a digital campaigning um, team, uh, moving stuff to the cloud, that sort of stuff. Um, so that'd be due for redoing. Um, okay, so this is one that we did for Flack as well. And I've taken off names. Oh, I've left some on there, sorry. Um, so this is a bit more of a simpler one. Um, and this, this is the other part of the document I showed you earlier when we showed you the the tech stack. So digital coordinator, liaisons with different teams, um, supports subgroup leads, manages asset map, keeps an eye on comms, channels to reduce duplication. Social media, and you'll notice on all of these, on every single role, most of them is induct volleys. So we're building the idea all the way from the start is that your primary role in any role is to induct more people to help you. Um, we really want to move away from anyone that was taking, we want people to take ownership, but we didn't want them to take, um, like, this is their patch and stay away from me. We, we want to share ownership on everything. So here are the different tasks that we do. So social media, traditional media, content production, managing data, managing a bit more of the tech geeky stuff, um, managing the security um, tech, um, tech support, and volley coordination. Um, so you can see that they're, they're quite distinct roles for, for volunteers. Um, so without this sort of mapping, it would be like, oh, well, that's just the, the web person, and usually the person, the web person. And so that is really hard to scale. It's hard to get volunteers. It also means if a volunteer comes into a situation where, oh, they're the tech team, they just get burnt straight away, burnt out. Like here's, here's a million tasks we did all at once. So here we can go very clear things. It's like, here's the clear job you can do. Which bits of these can you do? That sort of stuff. Um, for me, role planning is such a key important part of being able to scale successfully. If you're not planning um, roles, because there's, and there's also some people that want to come into a system and just be told what to do. So politics aside, um, here's the task, go do them. And then they're really happy because they've got some tasks to do and they're, they're supporting the campaign and you're just getting some tasks done. Okay, building online community. All right, so um, in what in this, this is written more around um, a say Facebook group or um, uh, online forum, those old fashioned online forums, um, you know, LinkedIn group, that sort of stuff. 
So just say that we're, so just say I was going to um, start up a um, action skills tech support Facebook group, for example. So the first thing we need to do is we need to design the culture. Um, if you don't design culture of a group, it will get designed for you. And um, sometimes you're lucky and that's good, but then sometimes some of the negative parts of the human aspect will um, come to the fore. So what is your culture? Is it a positive? Um, are you always sharing? Um, or is it um, more like a bro culture where you're just um, putting people down? So you actually want to define that. So um, all the people you work with can agree, yeah, we want to have a very positive culture. We want to um, behave in a certain way. Then you write some guidelines and then rolls on that, it's on how to manage that. So that means when new people come in, they're like, oh, this is, this is um, how this culture is. So culture needs to be um, designed, managed, and then maintained. So a bit down the track, if somebody's um, acting out of line, instead of you being like some sort of police person going, oh, you're out of line, um, it can be approached to say, here's the culture and the guidelines that we've got. You're in breach of this. Like, what are you doing? Like, pull your head in. Like, aren't you part of this, this culture? So it makes it a lot better to manage it and that sort of thing. And part of that requires community managers. Um, so in any sort of this type of environment, you really need to um, have people that are actually managing that culture. Um, you know, if someone's out of line a little bit, it might be a certain comment here or there that sort of brings it back in place or say a bit more full on if they're really outside of, out, out of the guidelines, that sort of thing. Um, because then if you've got a happy, the culture is in the flow, that's when, when people join or then things just flow. And you would have seen it being in Facebook groups yourself where you've got a really good Facebook group and this is great. And then you get some, some negative people come in and they just start, you know, bitching at everyone and just being idiots. And then everyone leave, all the good people leave and then you're just left with this yucky group and then everyone leaves. So you really want to make sure, you really need to nip that behavior in the bud up front um, so it doesn't grow to be negative and you always want to then support and nurture the good good behavior um, and this is totally the same in offline environments as well um, it's just probably it's easier offline to, to do some of these subtler things um, seeding okay so if you're starting a group just say I start my new action skills group and um, you come in there and there's no one in there and you're like great i'm gonna post a question um how do i sort a zoom webinar and then no one answers you like, oh okay i'll just wait till other people come no you won't wait you'll just leave so to start you actually need to have a community before you start a community um you know chicken or the egg thing so in that case um if if i was to start a community i'd get a few people that i know and say look um would you help me start this community um, handful of people, six people, 10 people. So we're gonna do a launch on this date. Could you hang out for two weeks, for example? And so they would agree to come in every day and just participate in the community. So someone comes in and asks a Zoom question, then you know, you've know you got a few people that will comment, go, oh, this is what I think about Zoom, this or that. And then that person goes, this is great. This is a great community. I'm gonna hang out here, I'm gonna tell my friends. And so then you can start getting it to, to, to build up in its own steam. Um, so it's quite key to, unless you've already got an established community and then you take them into an online forum, that can work. But generally you need to seed it um, to get it going. Okay, you need to manage trolls. Um, and I'm gonna use the example, not of groups, but of the FLAC Facebook page. Um, FLAC, uh, Frontline Action on Coal. So they're up in Queensland at the moment, um, blockading the Adani mine. Um, every time they do an action, they get hammered by tro a troll army. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of comments from these subhuman uh, people. Um, some really horrific stuff. So we actually have a whole team just to manage comments on our Facebook page. Um, so that's a Facebook group. Makes sense to be in there. Um, and they yeah what works so that that needs to be in place because if if we've got a post and then it's just got all this horrible stuff on it then we'll actually lose all of our um all of our actual genuine traffic um sometimes 
trolls actually have some some points or discussion at that point if they're not being aggressive then you can also discuss with them and it's a good platform to discuss their point of view etc etc um so um the other thing with the flak troll group is we also have to have a mental health support group because some of the stuff that's coming out of there is actually quite awful um so we also got to manage the fact that you've got some really nice environmentalist people who want to save the world having to deal with these awful people and their comments so that actually takes a bit of a mental toll so there's also some things we've got in place to have a bit of a support group and make sure no one's doing very long shifts on that just to make sure that um they're yeah not getting burnt out by that that process how do you manage trolls on a group versus a page um so a page is more public facing so if they're aggressive we just delete them so if they're swearing or um like using violent language or just if yeah i mean if they're just there to abuse you then delete them if they um have some valid points you may want to um debate them in conversation um more mainstream um pages like so if, if it was the liberal party and i we actually i, I watched a talk by their social media manager they just delete anything anything that's not 100 percent positive to the liberal party they just delete because they want to create this bubble of um positivity that liberals are, is, a, is great and they just don't want one glimmer of anything we're, we're a bit different because we prefer to talk to free thinkers and we want people to be free thinkers including people who disagree with us so if they're not being aggressive and dumb asses then we'll we'll have a discussion with them um if if they're obviously quite um problematic we just block them um in a pay in a group a group you won't get aggressive trolls as much because i mean you just delete them again um usually a group's more of an invite only or um you know more of a people are there because they want to be part of that group so if people are trolling in a group it would be more um you know the community managers reaching out to them and saying, hey, what's with the behavior? I mean, this is assuming it's borderline. I mean, if it's if it's obviously in breach, you just go, there's your one, your one uh, mark, you get another two, we'll kick you out. But if they're being borderline, um, then you talk to them and go, you know, why are you behaving like this? Or, you know, da da da. Um, the subtleties in human um, facilitation would depend on context on the group. Um, exactly what's being said that sort of stuff but it's important to actually have someone that will be managing that um, because generally most people won't want conflict so if someone's being a troll most people would just rather leave the group than to um than to um deal with the person so if you've got someone that was willing to deal with the person then that just um means that that person who's conflict averse can still be in a happy safe place uh retrials fb can filter posts with specific words yeah um for us swear words don't work as much because you know <laughs> a lot of the people we work with swear so um but yeah if there's specific problematic terms um maybe you could program racist terms for example or very very specific gendered um terms you could filter out um if it's a racist term then that's obviously not a comment you want uh and then the final point i'm going to make is a real uh cheesy um corporate term and that's empowering brand advocates so for example on the telstra has set up these forums support forums and there's people who love telstra so much that um they'll go onto the support forums for free and um support people and uh, that seems really weird to me, but um, you know, Telstra's not stupid. So what they do is they empower these people um, and support them. Um, and the, so you'll be looking at um, people within your community that are, um, let's just say there's a, a gray area troll that you're having a discussion with, and then someone else jumps in and is having a discussion with you you want to look after those people because they're your brand advocates so i mean one thing is you can invite them into the organization um, or if they're having a discussion with a troll 
um, a grey area troll, I'll say that because if they're a black troll, you just delete them. Um, you may then jump in the conversation and back them up and that sort of thing. Um, or you may um, give them various powers. Um, some forum software will let people have badges and you know all that sort of stuff. So if you if you start if your community's getting big enough and you're starting to see supporters or people that are just organically um, batting for you, then work out a way to support them. Okay, any questions? So that's the wrap up of the official content for today's webinar.